Hello, this is the Climate Conversation Series hosted by CCAG. We're glad to have you join us today. My name is Shei Fumi Adebote in the company of Dr. Fatima Denton and Mr. Philip Osano. Post-carbon opportunities for Africa, that's the focus of our conversation today. In the last two decades, if you put all 54 African countries together, the contribution to global carbon emissions is somewhere around 4%, very minimal. Yet, the continent continues to bear a disproportionate impact of climate change, from ecosystems to economics to food systems and multidimensional poverty. We have seen lots of disruptions when it comes to how the African continent is coping with climate change today. This means one thing, Africa needs to redefine its position and begin to craft its own future when it comes to this transformation, this development, or if you like, call it a transition to respond to the multiple challenges of climate change. Today, we have Dr. Fatima Denton. She is the director of the United Nations University Institute for Natural Resources in Africa. Before now, she worked with the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa, UNICA, as the director for Special Initiative Division and the coordinator of the African Climate Policy Center. Dr. Denton is also a lead author for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, and she's been part of the fourth, fifth, and sixth assessment reports. Our research focus around climate adaptation with a focus on resilience system on the African continent. And yes, she's a member of CCAG. Good to have you with us uh, today, Dr. Denton. Thank you very much. We're also very pleased to have with us Mr. Philip Osano. Philip Osano is the Center Director of the Stockholm Environment Institute in Africa. His interest is in environmental policies, developments, and international affairs. Mr. Philip has diverse research ranging from the field of biodiversity, ecosystem governance, land use change, climate change adaptation, and integrated environment planning. He brings to the conversation today his knowledge from over 15 active years of working in 12 African countries. Thank you so much for being with us today, Philip. Thank you so much, Shay, and good to be invited. May I begin with you, uh, Dr. Denton? In your role at the United Nations University, you speak a lot about post-carbon opportunities for the continent. You also talk a lot about Africa's unique position. Can you paint a picture of a post-carbon Africa for us and share with us what the continent already has that gives us an edge to create this post-carbon Africa? Thank you very much um, for that question. Well, I think very often when we talk about um, climate change impacts and we talk about the transition out of our current use of fossil fuel, we have a tendency to talk about a lot of challenges that the continent is facing and some of those you've already outlined. So I guess um, the premise here is to think of a more hopeful transition for Africa, a transition that is on Africa's terms actually, where the continent can begin to define and design its um, trajectory for low carbon development. What we are saying and what I guess we've been saying for a long time, and we're not alone in this, is that the Africa is, um, is ready for the transition, but that readiness comes with some preconditions as well. Obviously, we've been talking a lot about some very difficult structural problems right now. Whatever way you look at it, um, the continent and the world, I guess, is faced with this poly crisis that we see um, and that we're going through. And that has also translated into geopolitical insecurity. And the African continent has long been perceived as a continent of wealth, as a continent of infinite resources. But of course, um, these resources have not actually benefited the vast majority of Africans. And so we should um, envisage anchored on Africa's priorities, supported by the insights of uh, many of our decision makers, our policy makers, in terms of the the benefits they want to see. So in a nutshell, I'd say, yes, a post-carbon world is possible. It's possible because this is a continent that's very richly endowed from some of the projects that we have going that have been developed, uh, the Grand Renaissance Dam, the Inga Dam. But I also want to mention 
that um, although this is possible, we shouldn't also oversimplify the story. <laughs> uh, because I think very often we're very quick to talk about how how much wealth Africa has, the, the potential it has. And I think that's fine, but it, should, it, it shouldn't stay just as potential. We want to see it go and move beyond potential. We want to give it lengths, basically. Um, so it's important that we, in, in as much as we're talking up all of these projects that are going on, the resources that we have, the wealth that we have, the capacity that we have, the human resources in terms of a, a demographic dividend um, and the sheer number of people um, in the continent and of young people, um, bright entrepreneurial people, we should also realize that um, the story cannot be oversimplified. There are huge structural problems. We're dealing with massive debt at the moment where countries are facing this anxiety um, in terms of restructuring their debt, paying their debt. And all of that is, is coming at a time when the, the impacts of climate change is, is almost like an assault on many African economies. So yes, we, we need to be helpful. We need to be optimistic, and that was um, that was actually very much um, perceived in the last um, Africa Climate Week um, recently by leaders like uh, President Ruto. I mean, it was actually quite infectious that we were seeing some bold confidence and, and leadership mm -hmm. that these things are now possible. It, we're not just um, um, waiting for these events to unfold, that we have things that we can do and, and, and say. So that's that's very good. But I, I also just want to, to, to mention and to maybe lightly caution that leapfrogging and all these words that we use uh, are fine, but we, we can't leapfrog ourselves out of some of the very entrenched structural problems that are there. We have to move towards fixing those um, We'll come back to talk a little more about leapfrogging and these terminologies, but you made this very important point that we must not simplify the case for a post-carbon Africa. And this is where I'll turn to you, Philip. The Stockholm Environment Institute, where you are the Center Director for Africa, is at the forefront of how research and policies can shape sustainable development. Dr. Denton also talked about how we need more of research to guide this post-carbon Africa. So my question to you, uh, Philippe, from your position where you stand, what are the key sectors that are vital to Africa's development while keeping in mind this transition and to see that this transition is just and sustainable? What sectors do you think uh, will come to play here? Thank you, Shay. Um, you know, when you talk about development, it's good before I even talk about the sectors, I always say that Africa is suffering from what I call development penalty. Um, one, because of the levels of poverty, and if you look at the current income levels um, and the standard of living, Africa is one of those regions that has the lowest standard of living. And so the challenge that African leaders have is to make sure that in this post-carbon um, world, that they raise the standards of living of Africa, even to the just the average, uh, average global average. Uh, without necessarily increasing further emissions and at the same time uh, managing the risks that are coming at the moment around 650 million people in Africa do not have access to electricity nearly 900 plus million uh, people do not have access to clean cooking so energy transition of course is very important uh, the second sector that has become important of course is uh, mobility so transport sector the third sector which i think probably is the most important of all is agriculture agricultural production uh, both crop and livestock agricultural crop production in africa has come from extensification it's actually increasing the area of land under cultivation not necessarily increase a unit area which is intensification and of course that needs to change and of course we are seeing a large share of particularly and CO2 greenhouse gases uh, like methane having uh, quite a, a substantial part of that actually comes from agriculture. And then of course, um, we talk about waste management. Again, waste management is a challenge. Uh, we see that increasing. Uh, we see very uh, little infrastructure in African cities to manage waste. Uh, that's of course also contributing to the health burden. And lastly, of course, I talked about the sector of building sector there. there and how that sector is using efficiency in the energy system. So the residential sector, 
building and construction is also very important sector. So I would mm. point those five areas as key. Great. Energy, transport, agriculture, which you call the most important, waste and building sectors. But if you had to make this connection of how this how we can connect climate and policy agendas to these sectors, how, how exactly would you make that connection, uh, Philip? The connection is simple. I mean, uh, eight of these sectors are emission, source emission sectors. So if you look at uh, transport, for example, uh, or if you look at agriculture, we have talked about the sectors that emit greenhouse gases. You also need to think about adaptation. And when you talk about adaptation, we're talking about the key sectors are agriculture, because agriculture, of course, in sub-Saharan Africa, particularly nearly uh, on average, between sixty to seventy percent of employment in, in, is, in, you know, of employment is in the agriculture sector. A huge part of that is you know, between thirty, I think, to forty, fifty percent in some countries. The GDP is, is from agriculture. So when it comes to adaptation, then of course agriculture becomes very important. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, when you look at human settlements and you look at uh, you know climate-related extremes, you know, when, when, when they are talking about flooding or droughts when it comes to sectors like livestock and so on, then it's become important. And you connect to the climate policies because countries have national policies. Uh, most countries have NDCs, but also at the regional level. Uh, now there's an African Union climate change and resilience strategy. Um, and of course, every sector strategy at the regional level now has some elements of climate action, whether it's in, tran in transport, in energy, uh, or, or in agriculture. And of course, energy sector, I think, just building up on what Dr. Dento talked about, I think the biggest opportunity from the Africa Climate Summit is to see the energy resources available in Africa being deployed uh, through investment in capital and technology to not just decarbonize, uh, not just to, to, to transition African countries into a cleaner energy, as we've seen in a country like Kenya, which now has invested quite a lot in thermal, but is also to decarbonize the global world, uh, the global, the, the industrialized world. That possibility to, does exist. Thank you for making that as simple as it could be. I'll come back to you, uh, Dr. Denson here, picking up on what should be the climate and policy agendas across the continents. This also means that we cannot continue with business as usual. And this is some sort of revolution, if you want to call it, people, uh, governments, companies have to revolutionize how they operate for the twin purpose of both improving productivity and yet supporting a low carbon or zero carbon future. But I imagine this will come at a very huge cost. How do you think we can get around this, uh, Dr. Denton? I think the, the first point to say is this is not necessarily a futuristic thing. It's happening now. Let's contextualize it a little bit. There, there, there is a pushback from a number of countries in Africa about the speed of the transition and the fact that they feel the, their energy sovereignty and their rights to development has been denied to a certain extent. And I think that they don't see this as um, contradictory to their mitigation ambition. There are countries in Africa that are, you know, really big on mitigation even though, as you rightly said, the, the footprint in terms of emissions in Africa is below 4%, 3.8% actually, some would argue. So in, in many ways, governments in Africa that have found resources, and as you know, there are, there are still um, resources that have been found in Africa, oil and gas, and we're now talking about critical minerals, which is also not something new. There is a sense that the continent still has its own rights should be able to decide how it wants to take advantage of its resources. That notion of energy sovereignty um, is very much something that uh, many African governments are quite protective of. So, so that's the first pushback. The, the first pushback is that in this sort of rush towards reducing carbon emissions, uh, we should also pay attention to the pace at which this is done and recognize that some countries that are hydrocarbon rich and not going to find an exit strategy overnight. They are still in need of their coal and their oil and their gas, even if this is within a short window, but these are not things that they can just basically leave under the ground because in many countries in Africa, exploitation of these resources is very much linked to development. There is also obviously pushback from major companies um, that have always had a, a sense of entitlement, I'd say, 
in terms of how these resources are exploited. And I think for me, sometimes where the irony lies is that in countries that are very big about carbon emissions and carbon reductions, rather, those very countries have got multinational entities that are in Africa and that are exploiting away. They, they're exploiting away, they're signing contracts. Um, so they clearly do not have the same ambition as their as their governments um, back home. So, so that's a little bit of a, of, a, of a contradiction. Philip talked about markets and investments, and in the Nairobi conference, that was a very big conversation around markets. But I also want to say that we can't market ourselves out of this problem. I mean, markets are important, investments are important. But part of the reason also why we're here today is a, a system in place that has been commoditized. We, we have commoditized nature to a large extent. We've introduced profits to it. And that introduction of profits, the, the, the whole anchor of neoliberalism to a large extent is introducing market and making markets the principal vector in terms of how we address this problem. So we, I think the continent does not want to be in a situation whereby its resources uh, are marketed and are exploited to the extent that it's it's energy poverty that Philip talked about, it's energy insecurity, it's heightened, but the energy poverty and energy insecurity of others improves, you know. So, so you do not want to continue to be some kind of a conveyor belt of raw goods that are exported out of your country, that are serving other countries, that are keeping people warm during harsh winters, um, and where your populations and your people are not able to take advantage of um, basic energy systems. Um, so I think we want to sort of guard against, or, or countries in Africa, I should say, want to guard against that possible um, um, eventuality, that we are just a purveyor of goods and purveyor of um, services, um, but we're not, we're not first served. So, so the energy security of others should not be the energy insecurity of Africa. And we should find ways to ensure that in the process of commoditizing um, some of our, our resources, whether these are green minerals, whether these are this new suite of energy resources in the way of hydrogen, that um, there is a, a, a strong sense of ownership, um, ownership of resources. There's a strong sense of um, how these resources could trickle down and benefit African people and the population of Africa. I don't think we should just stay within this sometimes very easy um, headlines of, um, you know, this is the, the continent of the leapfrog. We talk very often in, in terms of potential, that we have the highest transition potential. I think to a large extent those things are true, but it's equally true that we still have to um, face a number of the problems that we have related to food systems. Mm. Um, we we have we a continent that have uh, huge problems related to degradation of soils. I, I mentioned the Congo the Congo Basin, but you know we're losing four million acres <laughs> of forest every year um, as a result of deforestation. Um, so so these are problems that we can't wish away. Um, and to be able to really embrace the full potential of land as a mitigation tool, energy as a mitigation tool, we have to face these problems that we have um, head front. We have to face the structural problems head front. Um, and that's where the whole notion of um, climate justice, and the whole notion of um, climate solidarity comes in because this is a problem that Africa cannot fight alone. Others would have to come on board and come on board to, to fully support um, Africa's ambition. And in facing this problem, my question to you, uh, Philip, is how can we then, given the work you've been doing in the past, how can we speed up the need to shift this mindset? Or how can we very quickly shift the mindset of government officials such that they can now begin to see African countries as leaders on a global scale for climate solution, as Dr. Denton has really emphasized? Yeah, thank you so much. Um, I think that the three things. One is providing them with the tools to help them understand the opportunities that can come in you know, the different sectors we've talked about. Uh, sometimes uh, it is not apparent that you know, uh, you know, these opportunities exist. Uh, number two, and I think this is where I think I pick up from what uh, Dr. Denton has talked about, a lot of 
uh, the resources that you know these countries have, whether it's you know gas or whether it's you know any other resources that they might want to exploit, requires technology and requires expertise. From where I see it, and and this might be a bit of a different view from everybody else, uh, African governments are not investing in education. They're not investing in infrastructure that requires just the basics of you know you go to uh, universities in the region, uh, public universities particularly. They don't have the basics in the science departments. They don't have the physics, the engineering, uh, the biology. The fundamentals that are required to actually build a knowledge-based economies. And number three, I think it's also a bit uh, linked to the first point which you raised about structural problem. You see a country that cannot meet, uh, say, universal access to clean cooking uh, or even to, to clean energy, and they want to invest in hydrogen. And they don't have the capacity, they don't have the expertise, they don't, they don't have the technology, they don't have the infrastructure. And it would take them maybe 10 or 20 times more the cost to invest in hydrogen to meet somebody else's security need. Yet they could have used just a fraction of that to just, you know, invest locally in renewable energy. I think th those are very important points. And uh, Dr. Denton mentioned earlier that we cannot market our way out of the problem. You also talked about the need for us to at least the African countries now and governments to build these tools from a local level to uh, invest in education, to provide infrastructure that can make this possible. But all of this comes at a financial cost. How do you think that the African continent can attract the needed uh, financial investment? I'll start with you, uh, Philip, and Dr. Denton can reflect further on it. I mean, I think, first of all, they need to look domestically. There's quite, I think, some opportunities which are not being tapped. Unfortunately, most times, when you talk about investment in Africa, it's almost the thought that it has to come from some foreign countries. Uh, Dr. Denton, do you have further reflection on that, attracting the financial investments that the continent needs for a post-carbon future? Well, I think we have to start from the premise that this is a global problem, and therefore it being a global problem and having a huge impact on Africa, given its very small um, carbon footprint, I think there's, there is to me, a, a kind of moral obligation for other nations to kind of reach out and, and help in terms of addressing uh, many of the problems we've already talked about. So I think I think the support needed um, right now in terms of climate finance, but also in terms of supporting Africa and fulfil its ambition um, is very low. We have to mention that. We have to overstate it. I think sometimes we all feel like we should apologize and we say, oh, well, Africa should also do. I mean, it's true. Africa is doing things. I'm in Ghana and I see quite a lot of effort um, being done in terms of carbon um, mitigation uh, work. So, yes, Africa must um, look within itself, uh, within its domestic resource mobilization um, opportunities to do something about the, 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 the problem and to... Um, avert a number of potential threats and dangers, um, you know, um, that are that are all associated to carbon um, climate um, impacts. I want to also say that I mean, Philip talked about the African continental free trade area. I think trade is a very important vector. Uh, the the AFCFTA um, is the largest sort of trading block in the world, um, with you know, potentially 1.3 million people, I'd say, um, that could be lifted out of poverty. So. Um, depending on how we organize ourselves, and again, infrastructure is important. You know, these are things we can't wish away. But depending on how we organize ourselves, um, I think that um, there's a lot in it for countries that can trade within themselves in Africa, especially in terms of energy and also our food system as well. Um, but that also obviously depends on, our, on how we we create the relevant infrastructure and how we trade. The debate on critical minerals, I think it's, um, it's, it's interesting. It's not a new conversation, it's an old one. That said, I think we're seeing a little bit more investment um, or investor confidence um, in, in Africa. So the extent to which we can attract more foreign direct investment, I think, in the continent would be very useful. There are things that I think some African countries are doing right now. We see countries like Zimbabwe basically putting a ban on um, some of the raw produce they have or, or, or um, lithium, for instance, um, and Zimbabwe is basically uh, put a ban on it. And, and that is really, I mean, I think people can argue with that in terms of its merits, etc. But I think 
some of these countries have realized that they have to incentivize um, local demand. <laughs> um, and if things are basically um, shipped away um, elsewhere, then it prevents that sort of incentive from, from coming through. So I think some countries have deliberately uh, are very intentional about how they can exploit their, their own resources. Um, but they see a priority also in developing their, their local markets. So, so that sort of um, um, local demand and how you incentivize that um, and how you create demand and opportunities locally, um, I think is also very important. So, so there, are, there are several ways, I would say, um, that we can look at mobilizing resources. But more than that, I think there is definitely a political will that has to come through. We've seen with the war in, in, in Ukraine uh, and Russia that um, sometimes this is not about an absence of resources, uh, but it's just about the political will and whether we are courageous enough to sort of um, put our, our best foot forward and, and start funding the things that have that we've been talking about for a long time. And we're, we're approaching to COP28 20, <laughs> now, and it's, um, it's, it's been, a, there's been a lot of um, unnecessary delays on, on, on decisions that should have been taken a long time ago. Thank you very much. And uh, when you talked about uh, the AFCFT and that, the potential of lifting 1.3 billion people out of poverty. That also sort of pointed me towards something I want Philip to quickly reflect on before we call it a wrap. The population today is 1.3 billion, thereabout, on the African continent. By 2050, the United Nations projects that we will be somewhere around 2.5 billion people on the continent. That's almost double the figure today. So, uh, Philip, where do you think uh, the population dynamics should fit into this puzzle of building this uh, or designing this post-carbon Africa? Uh, yeah, two things. I think one is uh, Africa projected to have the youngest working age population. We need to invest in uh, training a global workforce, a workforce that would be uh, competitive globally. But number two, and I think it's uh, what I point out is the cost of not investing in this younger population at the moment. Any, any, any delay in not investing in them will cost us a generation, and that generation cannot be recovered. You know? so, so that's why I point out the fact that you know, education becomes very, very important and it has to be the right education, right from basic education, uh, and, and that's part that we need to actually, part of that money that we're talking about uh, should go into our investing in infrastructure uh, and, in, and systems that actually build the right capacity uh, for global workforce currently and of course into the future. Before we bring today's conversation to a close, Dr. Denson, uh, just after COP27 in Egypt, uh, you said you were living, I quote you here, that you are living with a resolve to put Africa's interest first and with a renewed vigor to be a catalyst for positive change that the continent needs to lead the way. Mm -hmm. And you agree with me that we need more earned youth um, governments, companies that can have this similar resolve, this same vigor to support this post-carbon Africa agenda. How do you think that we can onboard more people, let me put it that way, onboard more people on the continent to embrace uh, the, this? I'm really um, delighted, I'd say, um, to see more people come on board. I mean, this is, this is a fight um, that is going to be here with us for the long haul and engaged citizens are important to the fight. And I think the more we can have an active um, civil society that, that understands um, the, the big issues, um, that can see where some of the blind spots are, you know, and that can speak truth to power, the, the better. You know, it's not, it, sometimes it's a matter of organization, but we, 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 we're not, we don't have an organization deficit. <laughs> Um, so we can we can organize ourselves. We can bring people together. The you know the youth are important and they they are very much part of this discussion. But I think we also need to look beyond you beyond the youth as well. I'm not um, in any way diminishing the importance of youth. Uh, we need to look at um, labor movements. We need to look at farmers, cooperatives. You know, uh, in every part of in every part of. Um, every sector of development, we see the impacts of climate change in Africa. And that's why in our continent, it's very difficult for us to kind of neatly separate climate change and development. They, they, they're so neatly intertwined. 
Um, and therefore, we have to assemble and we have to have different um, um, representatives of all these different different parts of our society represent um, um, their interest um, in this fight. You know, we all have to be part of the fight um, and appeal to the, 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 the conscience of our leaders as well um, in, in ensuring that, you know, when they think about the impacts of climate change, they are thinking in the interests of people, they're thinking in the interests of the, the enduring support that we want to see. Um, things happen in Africa, but they're not often consistent. And I think what we want to see, especially in terms of this transition, is an enduring one. So Africa can actually lead others to what a transition could look like. This is a continent where a lot of the things that others are looking for have not actually happened in this continent yet. Energy security, to the extent that we're talking about, hasn't happened in this continent yet. Um, and so we can actually demonstrate that uh, this is a continent where you can actually build um, the infrastructure for energy security um, and, and so many other aspects of the transition toolbox <laughs> that we require to fight this, um, these impacts um, can be found in the continent. Um, so I think that we have the tools, we have the resources in terms of people, we have the organizational skills, uh, we need to kind of get our governments behind us and to show the world what a transition could look like. I do feel that a continent with 3.8, um, you know, um, in terms of carbon emissions, um, it can be the envy of the world. So this is where I get to say thank you so much for joining us today on the climate conversation. We've been reflecting on post-carbon opportunities for Africa. And it's been in the company of Dr. Fatima Denson, who is a member of the Climate Crisis Advisory Group and also the director of the United Nations University Institute for Natural Resources in Africa. Uh, thank you also, Philip Osano, the Center Director of SEI uh, Stockholm Environment Institute Africa. And to you for watching and for learning, I hope that you have been um, not just inspired but very much educated and this can shape some of the solutions that we can co-create and see see them come to life on the continent. We also encourage you to share this conversation with your network. And until the next time, bye for now. Thank you.